What's going on, everybody? This is the day that the Lord has made. We make the choice to rejoice. We are glad in it. Do me a quick favor. Everybody grab your phone, grab your iPad uh, that you're watching on right now. If you're on a phone or iPad or Droid or tablet, y'all already know what I need you to do. Tag, text, and tell somebody. Hit that share button. Let's get this party started right on tonight. It's midweek manner virtual style. Y'all already know. First Wednesday, we gather. And then thereafter, every Wednesday, we gather virtually. So I hope that you are signing on. You probably ate dinner already. Or you're going to watch and eat dinner. Or you're going to eat dinner afterwards. But I need you to hit that share button because this is going to be a major, major word tonight. Grab that phone right now, that iPad, if you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, hit the share button or hit the copy link button and send it to your friends. Text your friends. Tell them that Midweek Manor is on right now. Hey, before we get into this lesson, just a couple of very quick uh, announcements. On August the 20th, we are having our Ministry Bazaar. That's our fancy way of saying Ministry Fair. Listen, every person in this church, y'all know my three C's, right? You're in Bethel because you want to be connected, covered, and cultivated. Our ministry bazaar is about you being cultivated. A part of being cultivated is you being in a ministry. You see the flyer that's on the screen for you, and I am encouraging every person that's a disciple of this church immediately following morning worship. We're all going over to the gym. Pastor Kim had an amazing uh, meeting with all of our ministry leaders on Monday night. They're all excited to meet you uh, in the gym. I want everybody to sign up for a ministry. If you've been in a ministry but got out, re-sign up for the ministry. You need to be actively engaged. Pandemic is done. We've gone from pandemic to endemic. Y'all, COVID is going to be here. So you might as well come on and get into a ministry. You see the information, August the 20th, immediately after service. I don't know if we're going to work it out, but I'm trying to get some food trucks so we can fellowship a little bit. But I want you, every ministry is going to have a booth or a table, and I want you to sign up for that. Also, our 185th Church anniversary is coming, right? And as you know, we are doing laying 185 forward, y'all. Listen, y'all are not getting those bricks like I need you to. We want your name or the name of your family or the name of a loved one and your name to be memorialized or to be uh, perpetually implanted at the foot of or the, exit, the entrance of our sanctuary. And so I am encouraging you, if you have not gotten your brick or bricks, that you do that tonight. You see the information that was on the screen. All you have to do is text uh, TBC. What does that say? I can't, they got that stuff so fancy. I don't know what that says. But y'all see it on the screen. Whatever it says on the screen, text that to 54244. Get your brick or your bricks so that you can be a part of what we're doing for the 185th anniversary. I'm urging you to do that. All right. Listen, if you know anyone um, that is not saved, they don't know Jesus Christ as their savior. I am encouraging you to invite them to church on Sunday, I am doing a full on evangelistic sermon from the same text we were in last Sunday. But Sunday, I'm preaching a sermon entitled, I Need Jesus. I'm telling you right now, you won't miss this. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Last thing, we're going to get into this word. You know, your giving is important to what we do uh, here in the body of Christ. We cannot do ministry without money. That's just the bottom line. People are always hemming and hawing. That's, that's my mama phrase. Hemming and hawing about giving. I'm here to tell you, if there is no giving, there will be no ministry. Your giving is important.
important. But even more important than that is the why to your giving. I was telling our staff in staff meeting in my uh, impartation yesterday that when you figure out your why, it gives you a passion to do your purpose. The why for your giving is because you want to be obedient to the word of God. And the other why in your giving is because God has promised your obedience will bring rewards. And so uh, you ought to do it right now. You see the giving platforms that are on the bottom of your screen, each of those electronic giving platforms. And I encourage you right now to go and give. Hey, even if you give now, and I say something in the middle of what's about to be an amazing start to a teaching series, you can go and sow an again seed. What is an again seed, Bishop? It's when something is said through the teaching of the Holy Spirit that is so revolutionary to me or confirming to me that I got to go sow another seed. So you see those platforms on the bottom of the screen and you go and give. All right, come on, let's get into this word. Let's pray. Father, take your word and illuminate it now for our hearts and our minds. Help us to receive it so that we can be cultivated and matured in our discipleship. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm starting a series tonight, and it will be our Wednesday Manna series entitled Managing Your Messy Realities. <laughs> I'm so excited about this series, Managing My Messy Realities. All of us have messy realities. I don't care who you are. You got some areas of your life that are absolutely messy. Lord, I got vain, y'all, for a minute. Look like I didn't put no lotion on. I look ashy. Maybe I'm not. No, I ain't ashy. I'm vain. I'm, I'm not ashy. Y'all pray for it. Y'all pray for it, Brother Bishop. Man managing messy realities. I want you to go to a very familiar scripture in Mark chapter 6. And I want to begin reading at verse 47. It's in the middle um, of where Jesus has gone to the mountain to pray and he sent the disciples into the boat to go to the other side, right? But I want to take up in verse 47. Listen to what it says. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against him. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. Listen, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought it was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. Listen to this. For they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. Listen, managing your messy realities it, it is absolutely a fact that all of us in here have some messy realities. It, it is absolutely true. We all have messy realities that we deal with, messy areas of our life that we have to go through. And sometimes what gets us is not the messiness, but the management. Let me say that again. Sometimes what gets us, what overtakes us, what overcomes us, what we're not able to deal with is not the messy or the messiness, but the management. If you don't learn how to manage messy realities, messiness in your life, by messiness, I, I, I mean uh, bills you can't pay. Haven't been able to find a job. Job, I'm talking about next week. Everybody needs to tune in next week. Because next week I'm going to talk about how you stay in places you don't want to be in. But that's a messy situation. Um, a marriage could be messy. Your relationship with your children could be messy. Your relationship um, with your parents could be messy. Your relationship with family could be messy. 
So by messiness, I'm not talking about the negative we think about when we say messy. You know, when you say, child, you're so messy. That's not messy, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those situations that come in your life that seem to have the power and potential to overcome you, overtake you, and overshadow you. As I was studying for this lesson, y'all, I discovered that in almost every miracle that Jesus performed, there was a messy area that gets overlooked. Hear that again. In almost every miracle Jesus did, for instance, in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus heals the woman with the issue of blood on the way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter, two miracles happen. The woman's blood dries up. Jairus' daughter is raised from the dead. But then there's verse 40. They laughed at him. Messiness. Over in Mark chapter 5, where he drove out demons and he anointed many sick people with oil and healed them around Mark chapter 6, verse 13. That's the miracle. But in the midst of that, we see the mess in verse 3. They took offense at him. Even over where he fed the 5,000, we see the miracle that 5,000 men, in addition to women and children, were fed off of five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish. Miracle. But we miss the mess that in the midst of all of that, so many people were coming and going that the disciples didn't get a chance to eat. What am I saying? That even in the midst of miracle moments, there are some messy situations. And in those miracles, don't miss this, the only reason the miracles happen is because Jesus managed the messiness. Hear what I'm telling you, child of God. There are miracles waiting on you if you can learn to manage messy moments. There are miracles that have been waiting on you that haven't happened. There is productivity that God wanted to give you that hasn't happened. And you know why? Because when the mess reared its head, Lord have mercy, you didn't know how to manage it. This, this familiar text about this storm, Jesus sends these disciples out in to a storm. This storm was a terrifying mess for them, y'all. The, the waves weren't just ebbing and cresting and crashing. No, no. If you've ever been on a boat in rough waters, you know those waves were bubbling up and exploding. The water was getting into the boat. And in this text, it says that later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on the land praying that he saw his disciples straining, trying to row through the storm because the wind was blowing against them. And the Bible declared in the story we read, Jesus goes down to them and they thought he was a ghost. Don't miss this. They are in the middle of a mess, in the middle of a storm. And the same miracle worker they had watched multiply fish and bread was now walking on the water near them, and they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they thought he was a ghost. And the Bible declares that Jesus told them, take heart. Hey, chill out. It's me. And he gets into the boat with them. The wind dies down. And it's interesting how the story ends. It ends by saying, that they were amazed. That word amazed there doesn't mean all like in worship. It meant like they were tripping. It says they were tripping because they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. Let me show you how they almost let a mess mess up their miracle. These principles I want to give you tonight are principles you need to understand so you can manage messy realities that come in your life, the, the unpaid bills, the bills you can't pay, the sickness that comes, the layoff that comes, relationship issues. Here's the first principle. Access without application will never bring transformation. Write that down. It'll be on the screen. Access without application will never bring 
transformation. Look at the text at the end of the story. It says their hearts were hardened. If you're writing notes, if you circle a highlight on your iPad, highlight the word hardened. The word hardened here means unresponsive, completely lacking sensitivity or lacking spiritual perception. Here's the question. How could these disciples' hearts be hardened? How could they lack spiritual sensitivity and perception? How in the world could that be when they have been with Jesus every day since he called them? The fullness of God had breathed on them. Jesus, the very representation of God, has been walking with them. They have served alongside Jesus, worked miracles with Jesus, worked miracles on behalf of Jesus. Jesus worked miracles with them right in the midst. They had witnessed the very power of God through Jesus Christ. They had walked with the very presence of God in Jesus Christ. And yet their hearts were hardened. They lacked spiritual sensitivity and perception. Here is why. Because they had not turned those expressions into personal experiences. Woo. The New American Standard Bible puts that verse this way. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. Don't miss that. The word insight, there is an interesting Greek word. Here is what it means if you're taking notes. The word insight means to put facts together to arrive at an understanding complete with application. Hear that. Insight is not just having an understanding. In the Greek understanding, you don't have insight until the, uh, until the insight you arrived at results in application. Oh, that's so good. So hear it again. They had access to Jesus, but because they had not applied what they learned from their access, their lives had not been transformed. And because their lives had not been transformed, their hearts were hardened. They had enough access and had seen enough miracles and had experienced enough of his power that they should have been able to manage this messy moment. But because the access of their information and the access of their experience had not resulted in an application that led to transformation, they didn't know how to manage their messy moment. Hear what I'm about to tell you. We can go to church. We can go to Bible study. You can amen. You can put the clap emoji in the chat line. We can shout on every point that is made. But if we don't apply what is learned to our lives, we will not be changed. Say that one more time. If you don't apply what you experience, and if you don't apply, apply what you learn. And if you don't apply the notes you write down, you will not experience transformation. If we've been exposed to a teaching that we know we need to implement and we don't make any changes, that's a clue that you got a hardening heart. If you hear teaching on tithing, but you won't tithe. If you hear teaching on forgiveness, but you're holding a grudge. If you're hearing teaching uh, on, on, uh, on having a transformed attitude, but you're still mean and nasty, it's a hardened heart. My question to you tonight, beloved, is what lessons have you learned? What notes have you written down that you have never applied? That means that you may be intellectual, but you have not had a transformative experience with Jesus Christ because information and inspiration without personal application will never lead to transformation. Back it up. Let me say it again. Information and inspiration without personal application will never lead to transformation. Say it one more time. 
information and inspiration without personal application will never lead to transformation. Sanctification is another word for transformation. Sanctification is not having laid, hands laid on you, you speaking in tongues. Transformation is when I have application to the inspiration and information I have received. Woo! Romans 12 and 2, we already know it, reminds us that we have to be transformed. Why? By the renewing of our minds. So really, transformation is a shift in my thinking. It ain't just writing notes. You can have a book full of notes and a heart full of bitterness. You can have a head full of scripture and a heart full of ignorance. These disciples almost messed up this messy moment of a storm because they had not applied everything they'd been around. Lord have mercy. I'm going to say it one more time. Access without application will never bring about transformation. Let me give you, let me give you a, another point. Forgetting God's promises will always make you forget God's presence. Say that again. Forgetting God's promises will always make you forget God's presence. Isn't it amazing how these disciples I'm sure had been inspired by the miracles of Jesus they had participated in before getting in this mess of a storm. And yet Jesus walks to them on the storm and they don't even recognize him. It's deep, hear it. They were close to him, but unaware of his presence. Lord have mercy. Close to him, but unaware of his presence. What did Jesus say to them in this scripture? If you were to read that scripture again, but climb up uh, before the verses I read to you, verse 45, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida. That's a promise. Go to Bethsaida. They are in the middle of the lake, which means they have not made it to Bethsaida which means the promise has not been fulfilled. Did you get that? But the storm scared them so much that they forgot the promise. And when they forgot the promise, they didn't recognize the presence. Ooh, that's so good right there. When they forgot the promise, they didn't recognize the presence. I'm going to say it again. When they forgot the promise, they didn't recognize the presence. And when you don't recognize the presence of God, it will put you in the middle of confusion. You won't know what to do. You won't recognize him when he shows up. You won't know that he's there with you the whole time. Y'all better hear what I'm trying to tell you tonight. Whatever you're going through, whatever storm you're in, whatever you're in the middle of, whatever you're up against, if you have not reach the place of the fulfillment of the promise of God, the only way that storm will take you out is if you quit. I'm going to say it again. If you are not have not reached the place of fulfilling the promise of God, and all you got to do is read the word of God. When you read the word of God, you'll see the promises of God. He promised to keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind on him. He promised to bless you beyond your understanding. There are promises over and over. He promised if you stand still, you would see the delivering power of God. The Bible is replete with the promises of God. And the reason that we get scared is because we allow the confusion and the messiness of our moments to cause us to have amnesia when it comes to his promises. Child of God, hear what I'm about to tell you. There's no way you should ever forget the presence of God because if you have the Holy Spirit of God, yes, then the presence of God is always with you because that presence lives inside you. How are you going to forget something that's already in you? 
How are you going to forget something that's already inside you? Because the enemy has a way of messing with your mind and making you think things are what they are not or are not what they really are. They thought he was a ghost, did not know he was the Christ. How you see a thing will determine what you do about a thing. They saw him as a ghost, and what did they do? They cried out in fear. I'm coming to that in a minute. They saw he was a ghost. They cried out in fear. How you see a thing will determine what you do about a thing. It will determine what you say about a thing. You got to see everything you deal with, everything you go through, everything you confront, everything you encounter. You've got to see it through the lens of the promises of God. The promises of God, the Bible say, are what? Yea and amen. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen him go back on his promise. I've never seen his promises come back void. What does the word of God say? That God is not a man or a human that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. His promises are yea and amen. And I'm trying to tell somebody tonight, he's made the promises to you about your future, about your life, about your finances, about your family, about your body healing, about your mind, joy, peace. And if you would keep your faith in the promise, you'll never forget his presence. His presence is always there with you. Somebody better write this stuff down. The only way that I forget his promise is if I forget I have his presence. But I have his presence. Lo, I am with you always. Isn't that a promise he made? I am with you always. How is he with us? Through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Which means if I activate, yes, that filling that is in me of the Holy Spirit. If I activate the presence and the power of of the Holy Spirit that has been promised. How do I activate it? I activate it by calling on that power to help me walk through things. I activate it by asking the Holy Spirit to give me the words to pray through this situation. I activate it by praying in the Spirit if that is what you have been gifted with or praying in the language of understanding. I activate that presence by knowing no weapon formed against me is going to be able to prosper. You ought to write it in the comments. God's presence is always with me. You write it in the comments. His presence is always with me. I don't care how rough the storm is. I don't care what waves are beating against the boat of your life. I don't care how many thousands of dollars you are in debt. I don't care how large the tumor has gotten. I don't care how bad things have gotten in your marriage or with your children. Child of God, I'm here to tell you that you can stand on the promise when you remember you've got his presence. Let me tell you one more thing. Try to tell you two things so far. Number one, access without application will never bring transformation. Number two, forgetting God's promises will always make you forget God's presence. Here's the lie. This is the one I've been waiting to get to. Be careful about what your mouth sets in motion. Mm. Look at this scripture again. Be careful what your mouth puts in motion. Look at this text again. Man, this study blessed me. So it says in verse of 49 when they saw him walking on the lake they thought he was a ghost they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified y'all see that word terrified terrified that that word terrified in the greek is the word terasso t-a-r-a-s-s-o terasso um here it is the word terasso the word terrified please write this down means to set in motion what needs to remain still. I'm explaining. Terrified means to set in motion that which needs to remain still. Come on, let's let's soak this in for a minute. To set in motion, terrified, that which needs 
to remain still. The miracle in the middle of their mess was walking towards them. The one who could speak to the water because he'd already done it before and tell it to shut up. The one who could calm the waves, hush the storm. The one who loved them unconditionally. The one who had complete devotion to protect them. And they missed Jesus at being terrified. Watch this. They set in motion terror. They set in motion anxiety. They set in motion, y'all getting it now, desperation. They set in motion fear. Woo! Hear this again. Because they were terrified. Being terrified set in motion anxiety. Set in motion desperation. Are y'all hearing it? When you are terrified, woo, you set drama in motion. Boy, that is so. Do you know how much drama you could have avoided in your life if you had not set in motion some actions and attitudes that needed to remain still? Are y'all getting it now? Some things that needed to remain still got set in motion by your fear. Ooh, that's so good. I'm going to say it again. There are some things that got set in motion that never should have got set in motion that should have remained still that set off a chain of events in your life because you were terrified. Hear what I'm about to tell you. Your mouth is what sets things in motion. Talk tonight, Holy Spirit. Your mouth sets things in motion. Your attitude of fear, watch this, is given life through your mouth. The Bible says you have what you say. Did, what did Jesus say about that mountain? If you have the faith the size of the mountain sea, the size of a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, be moved, and you will have what you say. What does the Bible say in the Old Testament? The power of life and death are in the tongue. In other words, when you speak out of your mouth, this is so good, your mouth sets certain things in motion. Why? Because your mouth gives life to some attitudes and your attitudes get manifested in actions and you set stuff in motion. Jesus, there are some things that are to remain still in your life. Anxiety, remain still. Desperation, remain still. Fear, remain still. Revenge, remain still. Vengeance, remain still. Anger, remain still. Are y'all hearing me in here tonight? There are some things that are to remain still, but the reason they get set in motion is because of the attitude we have and the things that we speak. Woo. Tonight, somebody ought to go grab some stuff. I hear it in the Holy Ghost that has been set in motion and bring it back to where it belongs to be. That anxiety over your finances, Jesus. That fear over your finances. That anxiety over not having a job. That anxiety over your sickness. That anxiety over your marriage. That anxiety over not having a job. That fear, that desperation over not being able to make ends meet. And now you're trying things you shouldn't try. You're doing things God wouldn't be pleased with. You have set in motion some things that need to remain still by what you say out of your mouth. They set it in motion when they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. You set things in motion when you turn an area of your life away from the direction of God's truth. Hear that again. You, 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 when you have areas of your life that you turn away from God's truth, you set some stuff in motion. Go back to what I said about the promises of God. The promises of God are the truths of God. And when you start acting in ways 
that show you don't trust the promises. You are turning away from the truths of God. And when you turn away from the truths of God, you set some stuff in motion. Are y'all hearing me? You are setting some stuff in motion. So how do I do it, Bishop? How do I keep from setting these things in motion? It goes all the way back to the first point, information. Have I sought out God's truth regarding my situation? You don't have a situation that God doesn't have a truth for in his word. You don't have a situation that God doesn't have a promise for in his word, whether it's finances, whether it's health, whether it's your attitude, whether it's your personal growth, whether it's your family, whether it's relationships. Ask yourself, information, have I sought out God's truth for my situation? Application, have I applied God's truth without compromise? Transformation, do I now own this truth as a personal revelation from God to use in this and future situations? Imagine, imagine the difference doing this could make with not setting into motion some stuff that needs to remain still. That is such a good word. You are setting some stuff in motion that needs to remain still by what you're speaking out. That's why meditation is important. That's why getting your mind straight is important. That's, that's, that's why uh, allowing, uh, Bishop Senior quotes this thing, allowing my mind to ascend back to the thought of thee, to the thought of God. Because when I allow my mind to ascend back to the thought of God, I will not set in motion some attitudes and actions that need to remain still. I I'm done. The Bible says Jesus climbed into the boat with them. Here's what the Lord is saying to you. My final thing, and this, this is the one somebody needs to hear. He's saying the same thing to you and I that he was saying by getting in the boat with those disciples. Here's what he's saying. I'm not running from your mess. Jesus. Hear that again. Jesus is saying to you tonight, I am not running from your mess. I'm climbing in it to be right there with you. Woo! That's the word for somebody tonight that even though you set some stuff in motion that turns you from the truth of God, even though you are exercising an attitude that goes against the promises of God, Jesus is telling us tonight that great grace is on you. And that mercy and love, I heard this in the Lord, the mercy and love of God is going to overtake you in a greater overtaking than the mess you've been in. Because Jesus is saying, I ain't running from your mess. So why are you? I heard that. If he's not running from your mess, why are you? If he's right there with you, why are you acting like he's not? You can manage the messy reality, whatever your storm is. Whatever that storm is you're going through, Jesus says you can manage it. Whatever this thing is you feel like is overtaking you and overwhelming you, Jesus says you can manage it. And you can manage it because of all the principles I gave you tonight. Man, I hope this has blessed you tonight. I'm going to pray because I really feel that somebody needed this tonight. I really feel, in the words of Pastor Kim, in my shana na, that's a word for Holy Ghost. I feel in my Holy Ghost that this was the word somebody needed. I know I needed it for my own life to be reminded um, that I got to be transformed and to be reminded of the promises of God that will keep me forever reminded of the presence of God. And this was the one. Stop setting in motion stuff that needs to remain still. Get your attitude right so your mouth will be right. 
Jesus said, I am not running from your mess. Come on, let's pray. God, thank you for this major reminder of how we can manage the messy realities of our life. Thank you tonight for the powerful revelation of what it means to be terrified. Because there are some people listening tonight and watching tonight who realize that their fear has set some stuff in motion that were intended to remain still. But thank you for your grace, mercy, and love that overtakes us in spite of us, that reminds us that you're not running from our mess and you're right there with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Or tonight you need a church. My three C's. Jocelyn, we got we to get a shirt or something that says this. The three C's of why you need a church. Because you need to be connected, you need to be cultivated, and you need to be covered. If you don't have that in your life, you're saying, I, I want that, but I don't know how to do it. Or you're saying, I want Jesus as my Savior, but I don't know how to do it. Or I want to repent and get right with the Lord, but I don't know how to do it. The starting point is what you see on the bottom of that screen. All you've got to do is text TBC Decision to 54244. You text that, you'll get a text back. There's a link in the text. I need you to click that link. And I need you to fill out that form completely. Send it back. You'll hear from our discipleship team about what your next steps are. And then meet me on Sunday morning. I've got a word Sunday. I'm encouraging everybody. I'm saying this again. I'm encouraging everybody to be here Sunday and to invite some people you know need Jesus Christ in their life. Please invite them Sunday. This is an event. I'm even going to do the altar call a little different Sunday. I'm encouraging you. I want you to go in prayer starting tonight and every day, every morning and night until Sunday for the most amazing harvest this coming Sunday morning because we need Jesus. Put that this DBC decision back up one last time for me for anybody that needs it. Text that right now. You can be a part of the community of faith called Bethel so you can be connected, cultivated, and covered. Man, I hope this bless you tonight, and I will see y'all Sunday morning. Y'all know how we do it. Peace.